Hello, welcome to Physics 2, Lecture 25.6, Faraday's Law and Eddy Currents. So uh, we'll begin mostly with a recap. Uh, we have learned in our previous few lectures that a current is induced or created when the magnetic flux through a loop changes. So anytime you're changing the field passing through a loop, in other words the flux, a current is created in that loop. Lenz's law, as we learned about in our previous lecture, tells us how to get the direction of that current. But we also need to know the size of the current, too, in many applications, not just the direction. Faraday's law will help us get that magnitude, or the size of the current. Namely, uh, in a simplified view, the current is simply equal to uh, epsilon, the EMF, over R. This is just Ohm's law. But we have to be careful because epsilon, the induced EMF, is not particularly easy to solve, um, at least with what we know so far. So this is where Faraday's law is going to come in. So keep in mind that this current isn't going to just sustain itself. Something has to be there to force current to continuously flow. In other words, there must be an EMF in the current, or in the circuit, in order to keep that uh, current moving. So something has to be there, a driving force. And remember, an EMF can be thought of almost like a battery, something keep, keeping the current flowing. So this brings us to our definition of Faraday's law. An EMF is induced in a conducting loop if the magnetic flux through the loop is changing. So we will get a current in the loop as well as an EMF. If that flux is changing by some amount, uh, remember the symbol for flux was phi, so if we're changing it, we represent that as delta phi. Over some time interval, delta t, we would find that the EMF is given by delta phi over delta t. In other words, this is simply the rate of change of the flux. In other words, how rapidly the flux is changing. And keep in mind that EMF, again, is effectively potential difference so it's still measured in volts. So this is Faraday's law. It helps us determine the EMF so that we can then get the current um, to go along with Lenz's law in giving us the direction. Now this is just for a single loop. If you happen to have a coil of multiple loops, all we do is multiply the equation by n, where n is the number of turns that your coil consists of. So nothing particularly new there. You just simply multiply by n. Now, I usually save my examples for the end of our lectures, but uh, just the way this one is structured, I'm going to do an example here, and then we will talk about our second topic, which is eddy currents. So here's a really interesting example, um, and this is one that's relevant to real life. A patient having an MRI scan has neglected to remove a copper bracelet. The bracelet is 6 centimeters in diameter and has a resistance of 0.01 uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, the omega switched to a lowercase omega, so that's supposed to be capital omega, that is a resistance. Um, so it's supposed to be capital omega. Um, the magnetic field in the MRI solenoid is directed along the person's body from head to foot. In other words, if the person's laying down, it's parallel to them. Um, and so that makes the bracelet perpendicular to the magnetic field. As the scan is taken, the magnetic field in the solenoid decreases from 1 to 0.4 teslas in just 1.2 seconds. So, the question asks, what is the magnitude and direction of the current induced in the bracelet? So, we're looking for the current, and we're looking for magnitude and direction. So, we're basically applying uh, Lenz's law in order to de determine the direction, and Faraday's law in order to determine the magnitude. So uh, I'll start out by drawing a picture of what we're looking at. So uh, let's say our bracelet is this. Um, let's say it's exposed to some um, magnetic field, but first let me draw, say, the diameter. So the diameter is six centimeters. And let's say it's in a magnetic field, so the magnetic field of the solenoid of the MRI machine. And uh, if we're looking at this edge on, so this is like 
Um, imagine a person it laying down into and out of the screen. This is the bracelet on their arm. Let's say the field is into the page. So everywhere around this loop, there is a magnetic field pointing into the page. So um, this is our setup. Now, um, the first thing I want to apply here is the angle. I just want to make a note that the angle um, between the axis of the loop and the magnetic field is going to be zero degrees. So I'll write this off on the side. Theta is zero degrees. Now remember, theta is the angle between the axis of the loop and the magnetic field. Both are pointing into and out of the page, so our angle is zero. You'll see why that matters in just a moment. So our goal is to solve for the current. Remember, current is equal to uh, epsilon over r by Ohm's law. So first, we're going to need to find the induced EMF, epsilon, um, which is given, as we just saw, by delta phi over delta t. So if this is the case, um, remember that from uh, past discussions, phi, which is magnetic flux, is equal to AB cosine theta. Well, A, the area of the loop, is not going to be changing. If you think about it, uh, the size of the bracelet isn't changing just because it's passing through this magnetic field, so that doesn't need a delta in front of it. However, the magnetic field strength, as explicitly stated in the problem, is changing. So we need to include the delta there. And then the rest of the equation is cosine of theta. So we have AB cosine theta and still divided by delta t. I'll never get used to this writing on a, a pad here. Anyway, um, so my handwriting is still sloppy. I apologize for that. Um, so we see that we don't need a delta for A, and we know that cosine of theta is going to be cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is just 1. So that term just goes to 1. In other words, it basically just disappears from the equation. Furthermore, since A, or the area, isn't changing, I'm going to pull that outside of the expression. So I'm going to write this as A times delta B over delta T. Just to kind of simplify it. And again, I'm not writing in cosine because that term goes to 1. So these two um, terms here are exactly the same. Now we do have to take into account the shape of the object uh, when we talk about area. We know that it is circular. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So I'll write that in as well. So we have pi r squared times delta b over delta t. OK, at this point, I believe we do have everything we need. We know the radius of the object, half the diameter. We know the change in the magnetic field strength. And we know how long it takes to happen. So we can plug all these values in to solve for epsilon. That will leave us with pi times the radius, which is half the diameter. So instead of 6 centimeters, that's 3 centimeters, or 0 0.03 meters uh, squared. Don't forget that. And then this is being multiplied by the absolute value of the change in the magnetic field. We're going from 1 to 0.4. So final minus initial would be 0.4 minus 1 uh, Tesla all divided by the time it takes of 1.2 seconds. Plugging these values in, we should find an EMF of a meager 0.0014 volts. With this, we can now solve for the current. Remember, by Ohm's law, current is epsilon over r. We do know the resistance of the bracelet already, so all we have to do is plug these two values in. We have 0.0014 volts divided by the resistance of 0.010 uh, ohms. So as a result, we should get a current of 0.14 amps, which is a fairly substantial current. Uh, remember, 1 amp is the uh, current of a household outlet. So this is about 15% the strength of a household outlet's current. 
Um, maybe not enough to hurt the persons in any significant way, but it is appreciable. Um, I mean, this could maybe affect the results of the MRI, perhaps, or something along those lines. Um, so there's a good reason why we remove metal objects from our bodies if you go into an MRI machine. Now, this is only part of the answer. It also asks for the direction. I mean, sure, we know we have a current flowing in this loop now, but which direction is it flowing, is the question. And so, here comes our discussion of Lenz's Law. To figure out the direction of the current, we need to apply Lenz's Law. Um, that I doesn't show up too well, but uh, Lenz's Law, remember, teaches us the direction. So, let's think about what's happening. First of all, we're going from 1 to 0.4 Teslas, right? Um, so, we have a decreasing flux. It's going to take me a second. So, a decreasing flux, right? Because we're going from 1 to 0.4. So, that is a decreasing value. Our flux is decreasing. If we follow our procedure from our Lenz's Law discussion, that means that uh, in order to oppose the decrease, we need a field in the same direction. So, induced field in the same direction. Oops, it's getting sloppy. Um, now, that means in the same direction as the original magnetic field, which we drew as being into the page. So I'll write that into, uh, we'll say screen. So it, now all we have to do is apply the right hand rule. By the right hand rule, we will see with our um, field pointing into the loop, that would give us a clockwise current. And there is the direction. The direction will be clockwise as a result. Uh, so that is our full solution. Uh, so now we will continue our discussion, moving on now to um, eddy currents. This is my favorite part, I think, of all of physics too, perhaps, and you'll see why very soon. So uh, here we're going to talk about eddy currents. So uh, we're going to start with an imagination sort of, or an imaginary demo, and then I'm actually going to show you the demo afterward. So Imagine, as you see on the right, a sheet of copper that's moving through or sitting in between the poles of a magnet. Now imagine taking that piece of copper and pulling it as quickly as you can off to the right. So you can see the F pole, the force of the pole, on the right. Now, copper is not a magnetic material, so it's not going to be like attracted to one side of the magnet or the other. It's, not, it's just going to exist in between them. But what you're going to find is that it takes a significant effort to actually pull that out of the magnetic field. That seems weird. It's not physically touching either side, but it's hard to remove it. So what's going on here? Well, um, the image is again displayed here. In the image, you can see two loops um, shown as dashed lines. So take a look at those loops. The loop on the right, as you pull this thing to the right, is going to be exiting the magnetic field. Right, so as the sheet moves to the right, this loop is leaving the magnetic field, which means the flux within it is decreasing. If you're changing the flux by law, we will see an induced current flow around this loop. So we get a current forming in this loop. So as a consequence, um, a clockwise current will be given and form a whirlpool type um, uh, circulation within the material. The same thing happens on the opposite side. We get uh, a loop entering the magnetic field, so its flux is increasing, and as a result, we'll get a current in the opposite direction. But when they pass through the magnet, or in between the magnet, notice that both currents are moving in the same direction. If you then use your right hand rule, um, with a velocity to the right, a magnetic field pointing, I guess, into the screen in this case, um, we should see uh, a force uh, resisting this motion. And so, uh, we get a really interesting result, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide. I keep saying uh, too much, I'm sorry. So, 
What we call these things are eddy currents. We're forming these little circulations of current within the object, and we call them eddy currents, or whirlpools. So, the whirlpools move in the same direction as it passed through the magnet. I got ahead of myself in the last slide, which is why I got confused for a moment. So, the magnetic field will exert a force on this current. By definition, magnetic fields exert forces on currents. So, by the right-hand rule, the force is to the left, opposite the direction in which you're pulling the object. So, this is a very, very interesting result. Um, because it acts like a braking mechanism. You're pulling it to the right, but a force is resisting its motion to the left. So if you stop pulling on it, well then the braking will take over and it will just slow the object down until it stops, which again I will show you in just a second. So it doesn't matter which way you pull the object, we could pull it to the left, the magnetic forces will always oppose its motion and it will always act as a brake. And so it will slow down regardless of which direction you move it. And again, I'll show you a demo of that in just a moment. Magnetic braking is used um, for a force associated with eddy currents, uh, for example, to slow trains in uh, transit system vehicles. So um, any kind of maglev trains or anything like this can be um, applying these eddy currents to slow down the train um, through, through air, so there's no significant friction or anything. But a more relevant... Uh, analogy or application of this is actually in our balances that we use in laboratories. So uh, if you took my physics 1 or physics 2 class you probably used a balance like this at least. Um, this is a triple beam balance and um, we see that these uh, eddy currents are applied to damp out oscillations that occur as the weights are moved around on the plate. Uh, at the end of the beam a conducting plate passes through a magnetic field. As the beam moves up and down, the magnetic force, which is always directed opposite to the motion, serves to quickly slow down that beam. So we're talking about this right-hand side. This method is superior to braking due to friction because static friction can cause the beam to stop at any point away from its actual equilibrium point. So that wouldn't really help us in trying to balance things. So this magnetic braking, however, uh, gets smaller as the beam slows down, and so, oops, and so um, once the beam is officially at rest, there's no more force to disturb that equilibrium. So all along we've been using these balances, and there's been this whole concept of magnetic braking and eddy currents and Lenz's law all um, at play in something as simple as a balance like this. So that's pretty cool. So to conclude this lecture, I'm going to show you the exact demo of what we just talked about, a plate moving through a strong magnet. I'm then going to show you a variation of that demo uh, to conclude this lecture. So I will give one warning. I don't know how loud this is. Um, I'm going to slow, like lightly reduce the volume. It might still be loud. If it's too quiet, then turn up your volume, but I'm just giving you a volume warning just in case. I don't know how loud it will be. So here we go. Three, two one. Of course it went away. There we go. Okay, so we just learned about magnetic braking, a very interesting phenomenon in which a metallic object placed between the poles of a magnet and moved will actually slow down and resist its motion. The uh, demonstration we went over in our lecture will be perfectly displayed here. So here I have two poles of a very strong magnet. Um, so there's a strong north pole, strong south pole, and a very small gap between them. And what I'm going to do is take these objects and hang them directly between the poles of the magnet. Now, I'm choosing this first object to be one with all these little gaps in it, and notice the bottom is not connected. So if I angle this up and I swing this back and forth between the poles, it does what you would expect. It swings back and forth and slows down gradually as friction uh, takes place and eventually it reaches equilibrium in the middle. So it passes through the magnet seemingly without issue. But let's see what happens if we use the same shape object but this time it's solid. It doesn't have those gaps. So now if I try to swing this through let's see what happens. Interesting. So it doesn't swing back and forth easily. As soon as one edge gets into the magnet, 
Uh, it slows down considerably and then comes to a stop. We'll try it again. So we are seeing magnetic braking taking place in real time. And I could try to reverse this process. If I very quickly try to tap down this object, it barely moves out of the magnet. So I'm hitting this pretty hard. It looks silly, but um, it barely moves out of the magnet. And again, if I reverse this, and I try to do the same thing, if I try to tap this object out of the magnetic field, it has no problem. So what we were seeing is magnetic braking taking place. The physical um, description for what's going on here is we are producing eddy currents inside of this device. So as this swings into the magnetic field, one side is moving into it, which means uh, its magnetic flux is increasing. Right? We're increasing the strength of the field, so more field lines are passing through it, which means the flux is increasing. Whenever the flux is increasing or changing, you produce a current inside the object. So we're producing little eddy currents inside of this metallic object. Anytime you have a current inside a magnetic field, we learned that the field will exert a force on that current. And that force happens to be in the opposite direction of motion in this particular demonstration. So one more time, we see the dampening take place. Eddy currents are now inside there, creating a force in the opposite direction of the motion to slow it down. All right, so we're going to continue with one more demonstration of magnetic braking. So here I have two tubes. One is aluminum, the one on the left, and one is a clear plastic on the right. Both have the same length and the same diameter. What I also have are two neodymium or rare earth element magnets, powerful magnets. What I'm going to do is drop them through each of the tubes and see what happens. So first, I'll drop this through the clear plastic tube. And you would see what you would expect. Uh, this falls through very quickly. These are fairly heavy magnets, and so they just fall right through, no problem. However, the fact that I'm recording this means something more interesting should happen, and that is the case. I'm now going to take the same two magnets and drop them through the aluminum tube. And let's see what happens now. Okay, so these took a significant amount of time to fall compared to the plastic tube. I'll do this one more time. And still falling, it's still falling, still falling, still falling, and there we go. So, what's happening here? Well, the same exact idea as what we were looking at previously. As this magnet is entering the aluminum tube, it is increasing the amount of uh, field strength in that region. In other words, the magnetic flux is increasing as it moves into the tube. Anytime you have a changing flux, the um, tube will get an induced current inside of it. So the flux is changing, meaning a current is generated inside of this tube. It's going to be a um, counterclockwise current um, that gives us a force that moves upward in the tube. In other words, it's an increasing flux moving downward, so to oppose that downward and increasing flux, the current generated has to be such that it produces its own magnetic field to oppose that change, as we talked about in our lecture. In other words, we have an upward force against the magnet to help resist its fall against gravity. This is the basis of Lenz's law. And so, um, we have an upward force resisting its motion, and so it takes a much longer time to fall through the tube. One of the things that I love about this demo is whenever you can do this for kids, um, kids typically know at least that a heavier object should fall faster in um, a normal Earth environment. That isn't the case in uh, a vacuum, but um, you can take two magnets yourself, like I'm doing now, and have another set of magnets that's like really heavy and tall. And you can ask the, the kid, um, you know, let's have a race, which um, we're going to each drop our items through these tubes, and um, you let the, the kid pick which object they want, and almost every time they're going to pick the heavier object. 
they're right that that would fall faster. But if you make them use the aluminum tube and I instead use the plastic tube, they don't know about Lenz's law and eddy currents and opposing magnetic fields, of course, so they're not gonna know it's gonna fall slower. So you let them use the aluminum tube, mine will fall all the way down in a split second, but even though theirs is heavier, it will still take a significant amount of time uh, to fall instead. And so it's kind of a trick you can play in kids, then because you've got them engaged with that trick, they're suddenly interested in the science. So anyway, um, I hope these two demos were really interesting for you. I wish I could do them in person, but um, this is the basics behind Lenz's Law. All right, so we can also look at what happens as these magnets fall in the tube from a top-down perspective. There you go. All right, so there you have it. Uh, so I hope you found all that interesting. The material and the physics behind it is certainly complicated. So um, for anyone, of course, in my class, always feel free to ask questions, set up meetings with me. We'll go through any example, any topic you need. So uh, that is actually the end of our Physics 2 course. So, um, I mean, if you've gone through all my lectures, especially if you're not even a student, if you just happen to fall upon these videos, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, and take care.